episodes that Hulu hadn't posted yet. Oh, yeah. What show are you talking about? Adventure Time. Come on, grab your friends. I really like that show. It's so good. Is that the one with, like, Boomhauer and, uh, yeah. like, I think, Hank? Yeah, they, uh, they just stand by a fence and drink <laughs> beer and solve mysteries uh, with her little Mexican monkey named Boots. Yeah. Uh, oh, if you haven't watched Steven Universe, that's another really good one. I started it. I... I need to pick yeah. up on it again. I think uh, the writer for that was on Adventure Time before she left to make that show. Probably. But, um, also, uh, if you haven't watched Gravity Falls. Great show. It's so fucking good. Gravity Falls is really good. I really wish that they would bring it back. Um, I want to be like the sweaty guy who starts the petition to bring it back because <laughs> I fucking love that show so much. And I'm already sweaty. I'm always sweaty. <laughs> I meet the criteria. Someone listen to me. I'm a sweaty white man. Why is nobody listening to me? Oh, hey, we're rolling, by the way. Ah, fuck. <laughs> hey, Hello and welcome to the Sweaty White Man Podcast. Hell yeah. Uh, we uh, which is hosts. every podcast uh, for the most part, including this one. Oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm sitting opposite a sweaty white man. I am sweaty in one specific part of my body, my armpits. And I am a white man, if uh, if you're wondering. Uh, and It was all up for debate. And uh, I don't know if we've told our listeners this yet, but um, Nick's uh, armpit is actually where his balls are. <laughs> And penis. We have to get a special chair just for him to be here. Yeah. When, whenever he puts his arms down, you just hear like a little, ow. Yeah, I, I had to go to a special tailor about it. It's actually a really uh, debilitating disability, and I, uh, That's why I'm I making don't appreciate fun of you guys making light of it, because it's, um, you know, it's not like <laughs> deafness. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> laughter is the best medicine. Yeah. yeah, so keep laughing at your stupid disease. <laughs> All what right. a freak. <laughs> well, um... Remember that time when Nick had nuts under his arms? Every moment of every day do I remember this. This is starting off great. Yeah, I'm too depressed now to record a podcast, so I think you guys are just going to have to take this from here. Nope. Whoa. <laughs> So, uh, take two of the, um, well, no longer sweaty white men podcast, but, um, that dried me right up now. Now it's, uh, the cage fight podcast. And we're here today to talk about the movies arsenal and knowing, which, uh, I mean, they were certainly films, uh, two classics. I actually, I think they're both shot digitally. So I guess we can't say they're films. Um, <laughs> I think you got the descriptive words for these movies perfectly. They are movies. They are, in fact, movies. Um, I mean, that's indisputable, I think. Yeah. Uh, there was, I, uh, I think our work here is done. Yeah. There's actors, directors, makeup people, uh, wardrobe. I'm um, not sure there was a writer, though. I yeah. mean, most good content nowadays is completely improvised. Like, um, people will talk about how... Uh, you know, all the best moments of The Office were improvised, you know? And so... There's um, a deer right out there. There's a, there's a deer behind me. Um, if For the listener... Um, we record this podcast in Bumfucky. Uh, uh, yeah, Bumfucky, Kentucky. Actually. And, um, yeah, there's some deer roaming around outside. It's an interesting sight. Hopefully they don't crash through the window and... Or finish first in the fucking NBA. Bucks in six. <laughs> Bucks in six. six. And we have really done it this time. Um, actually, in the first episode, uh, I mentioned that we were recording in California. Oh, yeah. Um, and then well, we, we said we were on the West Coast specifically. Didn't say California. Uh, and in fact... Well, every yeah. episode is recorded in a different location. Yeah, it depends yeah. on how much this money we have that week. Operation. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're on tour. <laughs> they call us the Cage Fight Globetrotters. But, I mean, we weren't lying. We were on the west coast of Lake Michigan. Ah, uh -huh, yes. Uh -huh. Oh, and speaking of uh, on tour, if the members of uh, National Pleasure are listening, the uh, band who does our great, great theme song, um, oh, I yeah. just want to say that that song has been stuck in my head all week. 
and um, congratulations because you did it. I I just I have some gripes with National Pleasure right now. Uh-oh. I mean, I I probably shouldn't be airing them out on the air, you know. And I mean, I figure we can edit this out or whatever. But the Cadillac Brothers are fighting. Arlo Steele is blowing off fucking sessions. There's it's just a fucking mess. It's I don't really even know what to do at this point. So unprofessional. Oh, yeah. If you could um, pick one extremely offensive word to describe them, what would it be? Garbage. No, I take that back. They're an excellent, excellent rock group. It's just the egos and just the infighting. I just, you know, it's the struggle is, I mean, you know, when Vincent gets to drinking, you know, for one, he spills a lot of liquor and I have a lot of expensive equipment in this room. So it turns into a major issue. You know, I don't want to turn this into a, I, I can play when, the theme song again if you want. <laughs> when Vincent gets to drinking, they're, they're great. But when he's not drinking and he's trying to quit drinking, they suck. They're, they're, well, they're yeah, really see, bad. that's the problem is that, you know, the rock and roll is it's driven 100 percent by alcohol. So yeah. you need it there. But, you know, when he's you know, he gets shaken without it, you know, he can't do it. But then he just starts he wants to fist fight everybody. And, you know, Arlo, you know, despite having the bulky, husky, manly voice, he's a very sensitive, sensitive individual. And I don't you know, and I feel for him because he he sounds so tough. So people want to pick a fight with him and he just can't hold his own. Yeah, no band has ever uh, gotten better from getting sober and like finding Jesus. So I don't know why so many do it. Well, don't forget about Corn. Yeah, Corn got oh. like fifty times better. When, I'm uh, sorry. When yeah. uh, Jesus got head. Oh yeah, Jesus got <laughs> Jesus got head, and uh, they released that dubstep album while Jesus yeah, was see, distracted. Yeah, see, without finding God, they would have never found Skrillex. Hey, Skrillex is God, so figure that Touché. one out. <laughs> well, so, uh, <laughs> so I think. The listeners at this point might be confused. I'm like, oh, I thought they were going to talk about these movies. We do not want to talk about these movies. If you can't yeah. tell, we uh, there's uh, there's not there's not a whole lot going on here. I'm kind of dreading this part where I say, uh, I think it's time to move on to the movies here. Um, do you want the theme song again? Yeah, I think we'll be okay. I mean, <laughs> we'll we'll be good. Let's let's not uh, muddy this. Uh, terrible conversation with great music yeah. you know the best way to remove a band-aid yeah. pull that shit right off and then watch arsenal 2017 <laughs> then you will know pain <laughs> so uh just a quick summary of each of these movies um arsenal is a movie about uh Something. two brothers and one of them is kidnapped and held ransom and the other brother is trying to find him and yeah it's about uh, brotherly love Mm-hmm. And it's, how uh, nothing takes, can stop it. Takes place in Philadelphia. Um, yes, brother, brotherly love. Um, no, it actually takes place in New Orleans. That was a bad bit. Hooray! <laughs> uh, knowing is about a professor who finds a note from a time capsule that contains predictions for all of the worst disasters that have happened in the last fifty years and uh, how many people died in them. And he finds a prediction at the end that says the apocalypse is coming. So he's trying to stop the apocalypse, essentially. Yeah, and that and man the, is Nicolas Cage. But the only uh, disaster that it didn't predict was Arsenal 2017. <laughs> yeah, which uh, it killed a good, you know, 97 minutes of my life, which <clears throat> you will oh, never yeah. get back. I think taking into account all of the. Um, all of the time that was wasted from all of the people who watched this movie, it at least amounts to like four or five wasted human lives. At least. But um, not to get ahead of ourselves here, uh, I think uh, maybe we should jump right in on Arsenal. Start uh, talking about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm definitely down because um, just stoked about this movie and the fact that it exists and was made. Yeah. It's uh, it's very exciting. Well, uh, Arsenal came out in 2017 and has an R rating, which uh, I think they tried to justify with extra excessive amounts of gore randomly. But I right, yeah, will get they, into they, that later. They um, went for the hard R. Um, <laughs> and uh, sorry to derail you immediately, but we watched this movie together, and uh, oh yeah, I had hoped that um, if the movie was bad, at least the friendship would hold up the evening. And it, if anything, it made me dislike you because you were in the room and so was the movie. And 
Yeah. Um, Directed um, by Stephen C. Miller. After that, I really didn't want to see you at all anymore. But uh, and here um, we are. We're working yeah. it out. Yeah. Directed by Stephen C. Miller. Um, production companies are Grindstone Entertainment, which, uh, I mean, watching this movie truly is a grind. Um, hey, you, let's get that theme song one more. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Emmett Furla Oasis Films, which is the weirdest production company title I've ever heard. It's, it's three different names with slashes in between them. Uh, I'm just going to interject and say that I used to live in an apartment that was rented out by a company called Grindstone Management, and if they have any sort of affiliation or if they have anything to do with each other, I can presume that they make garbage. Oh, hmm. shit. Damn. Well, if Arsenal's all they have to go off task. of, then yes, the same company. Yeah, I, I would say probably. Um, it definitely had the feeling of uh, being directed by like a landlord's union or something, um, yeah. if that's a thing. Ironically, Grindstone never took the garbage out for the entire time that I lived there. They saved it all for this film. Oh, yeah, we found their garbage. <laughs> Let me tell you. And uh, also, I didn't get my safety deposit back for this uh, movie, even though I left the place and I left the movie in better shape because I watched it. And my presence is at least better than this film. I don't know what I'm going on about here. We'll cut that. <laughs> uh, Grindstone, if you're listening, you owe figured. us money. <laughs> Anyways, Grindstone had a budget of $10 million, which, if you'll remember, Deadfall also had a budget of $10 million. And these films are connected. These films yeah, so, are connected. Yeah. Um, the Cage Man plays another character named Eddie with the same haircut and weird fashion sense. Uh, the, I think it was the director. Someone asked him on Twitter, is Nicolas Cage playing the same character? And he replied with yes. So it is the same Eddie. So... That's nice. I, that's cool. I just don't understand how. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and in case you missed our uh, Deadfall episode, um, Nicolas Cage's character from that was a madman named Eddie King. Yeah. And uh, In Deadfall, he's just named Eddie, no last name. Oh, right. They give him a last they, name in this movie. We, he has a last name now, um, and the director has confirmed that it's the same character, um, but he hasn't confirmed why or who made that decision? Because you may remember Eddie's face got deep fried. Yeah. Deep fried. And he, they tossed his body. Like he was wrapped oh, in yeah, a sheet. They, and they wrapped him in a sheet and dumped him in a Like he was 100% dead. He well, was super dead. Like if he was pretending, he did a really fucking good job. Yeah. Well, it might explain he had some weird like prosthetics on his nose in this movie. I don't know. What was with that? I, uh, uh, I think it's because his face got fried in the last one and he had some really bad facial reconstructive surgery to get him back together. That could be it. See, they didn't. The, the audience really has to do the work when it comes to explaining the fucking nose. And well, I, when it comes to explaining anything in this movie. Yeah, anything really. Uh, and yeah, yeah. Uh, if we are to believe that this is the same guy, uh, uh, maybe we're being led to believe he had facial reconstruction surgery, but uh, there's really no explanation for anything. So, yeah, I mean, the plot is barely explained by the movie. But uh, what plot, though? There's like, hardly there was no a plot. plot. There's it's... a plot set up. <laughs> there's there's a through line out. of some kind, uh, but it doesn't really matter. Um, it's it's really just trying to get you to the point where like, oh, we're gonna shoot shit, and uh, here's the reason why we're shooting shit. And even room. then, they only shoot like five people. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but it it is called Arsenal, um, and <laughs> no one knows why. There wasn't much of an arsenal. There um, was a pistol and a shotgun and, and a flashbang. Flash flash and a flashbang. There were yeah. like. There were pistols. There were many least. scenes about that flashbang. <laughs> there were. Okay. Well, it was. Uh, hey, it was the classic rule of threes. You know, it was the setup. It was the reminder. It was the payoff. So, oh, I and mean, at least they off. had taken like a screenwriting class or something. Uh, it doesn't really show in the rest of the film, but <laughs> it's I was just... a little disappointed that they never uh, did any callbacks uh, explaining why John Cusack had a vape in his hand in the car. Uh, and didn't use it. So he was a cop, right? Yeah, he was like a... Was he a detective or something? Or? I had no he, idea what the hell he was. I'm I thought he was just positive, some dude that the character knew. I'm fairly positive he was like a plainclothes detective. Yeah. But like there were parts of the movie when John Cusack was like, Oh, I can't be seen here or whatever. It's like, why? You're a cop. You can go wherever. And just 
Yeah. You're like, hey, I'm a cop. <laughs> and also, there, there's a scene in the movie where um, they're when they're looking for his brother who uh, has been kidnapped, and John Cusack is like, uh, they're questioning somebody, and he's like, don't fuck with me, I'm a cop. And I think it, I missed that. It felt like he was lying. Like, yeah. Because at first like, I was like, oh, he's pretending to be a cop so they can get information from her. But then... He, it turns out he was a cop. It wasn't a twist or anything, but it just is never really mentioned. He also, like, does nothing throughout this whole movie. Like, uh, what's his the main really character's name? There. So the main character, JP, who, JP, in order yeah. to find that out, I had to look it up halfway through the movie because it was bothering the shit out of me that I had no <laughs> idea what his name was. But um, he's really just there so JP can, like, vocalize his thoughts and they don't have to do, like, a thought monologue, I feel like, because it's really, he's just there for JP to talk to occasionally about what's going on and then it goes into the next scene about what they were talking about, but John Cusack has no effect on anything that's happening. Um, like, there's that scene when... I forgot even who they're confronting and for what reason. When they like go to this guy's house, but then the guy runs and JP like does this chase after him through a bunch of buildings. Oh, Rusty's house. Rusty, yeah. Rusty, who <laughs> is introduced as a redhead but doesn't have red hair, so I don't know what's going on, but go on. <laughs> but John Cusack's character like does that thing in like cop movies and everything where like one of the guy chases, the other one like goes around the other way. But he didn't go around the other way. He just like stood there. Yeah, he just kinda sat around why was his character in this movie i have no idea they had uh, they had money left in the budget to pay someone and uh they were like, john hey, john cusack? Cusack. Yeah. i mean cusack's a fairly big name maybe like 20 years ago <laughs> it, it really felt like they had written the script and they like they threw in this character named rusty who go figure is a ginger so they say <laughs> but then when they like casted the guy there nobody in the casting department knew that this character was supposed to have red hair nobody cared like he was it's it's not even an important detail but the fact that they like mentioned it twice before you meet him yeah and then who's you, the red-headed guy uh oh that red-headed guy oh that is, ginger yeah. rusty <laughs> yeah and i thought rusty they were calling him that because he was a redhead um but it turns out they call him rusty and ginger uh and he's just not a redhead uh, he just really likes ginger, so that's why they call him that ginger. It's his favorite, like, or he his always favorite spice. is drinking ginger beer. Yeah, ginger beer, and ginger ales. Um, they call him Rusty because uh, he is just, he's never gotten into a groove with uh, sex. Um, <laughs> every time he has it, he's just kind of, it's kind of like the first time again. Yeah. Uh, so, just kind of rusty. Well, I mean, we jumped into this pretty quickly here, but uh, the box office gross for this movie <laughs> <laughs> um, $41,037. Um, which confused me because I Mike told me that this was a direct to streaming yeah movie it was a direct to VOD movie um I don't know how the box office maybe it was just like a limited release for, for in a couple of theaters for something so, yeah um Rotten Tomatoes Tomato Meter three percent audience seventeen percent so men of the people here. About one in five people like this movie. I don't know what they're thinking. And those, Sorry. Uh, and That's a lot so of people out of five. <laughs> there's two guys not here, and one of them likes the movie. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. There's nothing to like about this movie. Maybe like, the box office, uh, the, the money that was made at the box office was just people paying their local theaters not to screen this movie. Because if I had, if I had known anything about it uh, in January of 2017... I would have written a few letters uh, to get it not screened. Maybe that money was like ransom money they made. Like, we will show you this movie if you don't pay <laughs> us. And <laughs> All right, so uh, let's move on to a plot summary of this movie. Summarize what little plot is there. Um, and the plot summary is done. Okay. Uh, that, that it was... literally could just be like two <laughs> sentences. Like, uh. We open with some children one's a teenager and one is like 10 or 12 years old and they're named mikey and jp uh who end up being our main characters we get a little flashback there uh mikey is kind of hard on his little brother jp but he's looking out for him he protects him from seeing a suicide which was very confusing while it was going on i didn't know who this guy was why he was pretty sure it himself. was their dad yeah oh okay that makes more sense yeah they they leave they're in the arcade um which so Again, later in the movie when they're going through it. This is an arcade slash bar slash strip club thing? 
I think those were separate locations, but it wasn't very well established through shots yeah, or anything. Felt the same. But he like enters the arcade and then like goes to the back, and then he's in this like corridor with that has the like, the tarps up. Oh yeah. So like it was know. the arcade, right? Because like even like way at the end of the movie, when he's calling him on the phone when he's taken hostage, he's like, "Let's play oh, some games." Yeah, we play video games. <laughs> oh yeah. And like that's how he knows to go to the arcade. Yeah. It's like what it what kind of establishment is this where it's an arcade for children and then like a dive bar you drop your kid uh, off and you'll get a lap dance <laughs> then when your kid's done playing centipede you clean the cum off your pants <laughs> and you take them home i have a boner i have a business idea hold on is that about the kids <laughs> or the lap dance <laughs> you don't have to answer that dave i'm i am dave's lawyer <laughs> Um, anyways. Yo, Kits from fucking National Pleasure is blowing my phone. I gotta take this. I'll be right back. All right. You got it, Chief. Well, anyways, Mikey goes into the back and sees Cage beating the shit out of a tied-up man and then murdering him. And then, uh, we find out that Mikey is working for Cage. And, um, then Mikey says to JP, like, hey, why don't you take that lawnmower that I have and take over my lawn mowing business and for all these old people? And then, um, I'm, I'm, you stay away from the arcade. And, uh, JP's like, yeah. And I only mentioned that because there's a callback to it later. But 23 years later, bam, JP has a kid. He also apparently sits around occasionally holding a gun to his head because there was one unexplained Mikey. scene. Oh, that was Mikey? Yeah. JP's the put together guy. Mikey's oh, yeah. the... the entrepreneur. Oh, true. Oh, in that opening shot, it wasn't well framed, and I couldn't oh, tell no. which one of them was holding a gun to his head. Oh, so no, thought, it's Mikey, because... so it, That makes a lot more sense. I don't know why I didn't put that together. Because Mikey's yeah. the one who saw their dad with his brains blown out, so he's the one who's like, I want to be like daddy. Yeah. Um, and I so he just... to be up like my old man. Some people go dad. home and, uh, you know, take a load off, have a beer, watch a TV show. Some people just sit on their couch with it gun to their head hey man whatever gets you off hey and which which one of those two do you want to be <laughs> i'm a mikey personally <laughs> um so uh jp gets informed by john cusack that mikey is doing some shady shit that might get him killed uh coke dealing oh yeah and uh i, I think we already talked about john cusack a little bit but i want to say that this is not a role meant for john cusack i i not it does not fit him at all like i can see him as like you know like your alcoholic dad or like a bad writer or something who's like going on a twist yeah. or something like, i can see him being like a desk cop or something like that yeah but maybe. not wearing a do-rag and a hat backwards and yeah that is not john cusack's look he just he it was a fish out of water situation uh every time he was on screen it just didn't feel right yeah um, and it's not even that he's like a bad actor or anything it's just that the the role didn't make sense he didn't make sense in the role and uh, his character was unnecessary yeah oh yeah yeah and uh yeah i think you hit the nail on the head when you said uh he was just kind of there for jp to you know voice what was happening to somebody uh, apparently whoever wrote this movie would like they didn't do a good job, but they at least didn't want to have JP walking around, like, talking to himself, like, my brother got kidnapped. And they didn't want to do the deadfall voiceovers. But <laughs> yeah, I, I think they wanted a reason for them to talk to that other undercover cop. Which cop? I... Like, there's at one point John Cusack's like, oh, let me figure out some stuff. And it's like, oh, I know this guy. And they, like, meet him under an underpass. Ah, uh, And yeah. that was an undercover cop also, or... Is an undercover cop? John Cusack isn't. And he's like, oh, yeah, your, your brother's kidnapped. <laughs> Just in case you didn't know. Um, but yeah. Uh, so Mikey has a teenage daughter and a terrible relationship with his baby mama. And they're just fighting all the time. Um, and uh, they're at the old Fourth of July BBQ. Yeah. And they're uh, causing a scene. Oh, yeah, they're causing a big old scene. JP makes it clear that, oh, he always invites them because it's the only way he can see his niece. Oh, and, yeah. like, that's why he wants them around. And just oh, yeah. Mikey and I don't even remember her name. Uh, it's not Alexis, right? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, 
ex-wife. Who, yeah. Someone was named Alexis. I don't remember who. That I might think be the that, daughter. I think, yeah, I think that was the daughter. Um, but at this point, we learn that Mikey is really hurting for money. He's looking for money to make rent, for money to make life good for his daughter. And um, then we see him walk up to the cage meister, Mr. Eddie King, in a bar and then Cage starts complaining to him about how Mikey ran off like eight years ago and he hasn't seen him since and he still owes him money. So Cage starts talking shit about the old JP man and says he thinks he has a way for him and Mikey to each earn six figures. And then uh, very next scene, JP gets a garbled phone call saying he needs to drop off $350,000 or Mikey's going to be killed because Mikey's been kidnapped. So we're kind of... We're kind of led to believe that Mikey and Cage are working together to fake his own kidnapping and yeah. extort $350,000 from his brother. Who is, um, uh, we're, we're led to believe that his brother is well off. They just say he's an entrepreneur. Um, yeah. He owns a construction company, I, I think, I, or landscaping or something. I wasn't something. exactly sure what he owned, but he owns something. But it, he still didn't strike me as a guy who just had, you know. $350,000 yeah. Yeah, $350, laying around it. Yeah, he, he had $10,000 to loan to his brother uh, for rent because, you know, the rent is $10,000. Um, and he spent that on the, the cocaine because he was trying to turn 10 into 20. Yeah. Um, and that didn't work. Economics. I'm back, by the way. <laughs> Who's this? How's, uh, how's um, Purvis? Was it oh, purpose? it wasn't purpose. Yeah, it was, was kids. kids. Um, I'll save it until later. It's it's kind of ugly, and I don't really want to air out grievances about a band. Um, you know, especially when I'm the trusted producer. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, you guys continue. All right. I think this is when we can skip forward. Uh, speaking of the fucking devil, purpose is calling. Oh, oh boy. Shit. Okay. A lot of national pleasures really at it today. Yeah. <laughs> Bad things going down. I'm not gonna pick that up. I'm I'm not getting involved in this. That's probably a good good choice. Well, um, JP uh, gets John Cusack to figure help him figure out where Mikey went. Um, and there, uh, there's many scenes of just like, is Mikey kidnapped? Looks like he is, but is he kidnapped? Let me find out. He is, but is he kidnapped? I'm yeah. gonna go to his house to check. Uh, okay, I couldn't. It couldn't get in. Nobody answered the door, so I'm gonna get John Cusack. And he is going to find the hide a key, which is under an ashtray on the porch. Um, and we're going to we're going to confirm that he's really not here. <laughs> and lo and behold, he's not there. He's not he's not there. But somebody is Uh-oh. a junkie. Yeah. A yeah, junkie. junkie breaking in to try and steal Coke. So this is what also confused me. So he bought the like 10 grand of Coke. And then immediately got it stolen before he could even, like, sell it or anything, right? Yeah, it looked like it was all still in a bag there. Yeah. Like a big-ass bag. How did this junkie, like, know to go here for more Coke? Maybe Mikey already started his marketing campaign, <laughs> but he hadn't, uh... It's like, hey, I got some... Coming soon! <laughs> cocaine! Come here! He's got billboards up around town. <laughs> I got some Coke coming in, and, uh... Hey, hey listen. Copy guy, tell me! <laughs> First rule, don't rob me. Uh, and then somebody broke that rule. Uh, but this uh, junkie, they're the movie's words, not mine. Uh, they call him Junkie. This must be his name. Um, he, uh, he didn't get the memo that the Coke is gone. And so they beat the shit out of him because they think that he, he, they think he has something to do with the kidnapping. Uh, and he came back to the house to uh, hang out. I don't, yeah. It's like, I'm Mikey now. But yeah, after a bunch of pointless scenes like that, we find out, or, well, JP and uh, John Cusack, which I'm going to call JC from now on. JP, um, also, I don't know if we mentioned it, stands for uh, Jimmy Penis. <laughs> J- Jimmy Penis. Good old... Yep, I'm hard again. <laughs> Oops. But uh, they, they, JP and JC find out that Eddie King is the one who kidnapped Mikey. And then uh, we cut to a scene where Cage is getting held at gunpoint by his brother, who's really mad that he kidnapped someone because he thinks it draws too much attention and there are better ways to make money. And um, so I'm going to murder you. Yeah, I'm going to kill you, bro. And then um, Cage 
reacts to this by going like, uh, 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 my brother is trying to kill me, and then diving in and starting to beat the shit out of his brother. So Cage just feels necessary to summarize the scene before he begins this, and we get... This is, I think you said, a 90-minute movie. Yeah. This is like an hour and 10 minutes in. Like, this is the first interesting thing to happen. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I cut a lot out of this plot summary because uh, none of it was very consequential. None of it mattered. Also, yeah. the the most blood ever produced from punching somebody in the face. Oh, yeah. He socks him in the face, and it's it's like his face was just a sack of blood. I, I will say, th- this is where I do give this movie a little credit. Whoever was like their cinematographer or setting up these scenes, it looked cool. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. When he like pulls back his fist and the blood's flying out, it, like... That looks really cinematic and would be yeah, a cool. This, the cinematography thing. was good. Yeah. There, there was some random cuts to slow mo that were just unnecessary. I mean, there were some good slow mo uh, sequences, but a lot of the t- some of the time it was just like a guy walking, and they it was in slow motion. Yeah, There's no so reason. many t- in that last gunfight where it's just like JP holding a gun. Yeah, there was, there was one that made me laugh out loud where JP is like about to kick someone and we get like three slow-mo shots that total like 10 seconds of him building up a kick yeah. and then he just kicks a guy and the guy falls over and that's it. Uh, but hey, You gotta build suspense, you know. But I, I did, I was gonna say the cinematography I think is actually the, the guy who's doing the camera work has a good eye for shots and framing. It's just, uh, the rest of the movie is he, terrible. He doesn't have a lot to work with, so... Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. and I mean... But there there was uh, some, like, shaky cam parts that, uh, you know, if anything, uh, the, the takeaway from this movie was that the cinematography was good, but the shaky cam kind of uh, ruined that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would say that the shaky cam was a little uh, much at times. Um, yeah. Uh, anyways... Uh, we we find out through a flashback that uh, Mikey refused Eddie's offer to extort JP, saying that JP is too good of a guy and he doesn't want to hurt him. And then Eddie gets so mad at him that he kidnaps him and goes through with the plan that they're going to do together. But now Mikey's an unwilling participant. And apparently he's very jealous of Mikey because JP and him have a great relationship and uh, Eddie did not have a good relationship with his brother who he just fucking killed. And if we know anything about Eddie King, it's that he's a very jealous man. Hi fucking yeah. Hi fucking yeah. That was the most disappointing thing for this movie to me. It was like knowing, oh, Nicolas Cage is reprising his role as Eddie. Like he's going to have some wacky, crazy scenes that are going to be entertaining. None of that was in this film. Like Nothing. it was. It he was... had like two lines when he was killing his brother that were like almost there. Mm-hmm. But just yeah. for most of this movie, he's just un. Not even mobster, just like a dude. It was completely unnecessary for him to be the guy from Deadfall. Like, oh yeah, hundred percent. If that was a ploy to like sell this movie, it, it, I don't think it worked. <laughs> and also, it made absolutely no sense because one, he died. Uh, so if we're meant to forget that, um, he lived on to uh, get mad at a teenager that used to work for him um and uh killed his own brother and there, there there was just no point to him being eddie yeah cage has so little screen time in this movie honestly it's mostly jp and mikey and i feel like cage just kind of took this role because maybe he wanted to just have fun and do that again sometime but yeah um i get the feeling that he might have signed on wanting to like have that like full control of his character again. But then when he showed up, they're like, no, no, this is what you're doing. Yeah. Because like, it was just so tame and like pulled back that it yeah. was uh, uninteresting. Yeah. And the, the two top build actors were cage and Cusack. And they were the two characters we saw the least of in the entire movie. Both characters. We did not really need to see at all. Yeah. Yeah. I was at for a second. I was worried that, uh, after that initial, like, cage scene i I thought that maybe it was just like a cameo and we weren't going to see him again for the rest of the movie and honestly i mean it there wouldn't have been much difference no you could have replaced eddie with just charlie sheen literally anyone (laughs) let's see that's who i that's the character i want to return i want dr lime and charlie sheen (laughs) uh in their own like buddy cop movie 
I'm going to skip past the little pointless subplot where uh, Mikey's daughter is kidnapped and then rescued in the space of about 10 minutes. Um, and uh, move on to JP figuring out through his phone call with Mikey where he asks um, Cage to put him on with Mikey to prove that he's still alive. And Mikey leads a clue about video games. So he realizes he's being held in the back of an arcade. JP sneaks in the old strip arcade from oh, yeah. their childhood. <laughs> the old strip <laughs> arcade. You know, every town has one. But, um, yeah, uh, JP frees Mikey and uh, they decide they're going to kill Eddie together. And uh, they act like JP is giving Cage the money in a briefcase. But in fact, they put a flashbang that they set up multiple times in this movie uh, where I don't know where they got it. But they put a flashbang in the briefcase so it's rigged to go off once it's opened. Which this is one of the things. So in that time skip from kids to adulthood, Mikey apparently was in the military and uh, yeah. dishonorably discharged. Yeah. Do but he doesn't just, want to talk about it. Do they just give you like flashbangs when you leave the military? They're like, here you go. Bye. There's, there's even one point where JP asks John Cusack, like how he came upon this flashbang. And he, there, there was no explanation. John Cusack was just like, he, he's ex-military. He, he has his methods. He has his methods, and he's trying to sell it for money. He needs money. He's, yeah, basically, JP and Mikey shoot up the place. They kill Eddie and the rest of Eddie's gang, and then they go play baseball together, and Mikey says, I'm real proud of you, JP, which I don't think proud is the right word there. You should be like, I'm very thankful for you, JP, I'm for proud saving my that you ass. shot that guy. <laughs> in yeah. the nuts. In slow motion. The, so they wrap up with that scene of them playing baseball. Uh, and, like, the, the whole movie, it seems like they're trying to sell us on this, like, brotherly relationship. Do you know, anything like, for your brother. I would do anything Yeah, that's the family. only theme that I can pull out of this, maybe, is, like, brotherly love. It's, like, you know family sticks together like you help your brother helps out you at some point and then the tables might be turned and you got to help him out always watch each other's backs yeah because uh you know your brother giving you a lawnmower is exactly the same as go help. kill this guy yeah, go kill this guy <laughs> you'd have to be a real uh sappy piece of shit to really be affected by this like brother storyline i just there it just wasn't I feel like this was made for someone specifically with like a brother who is better than you. And it's like, oh, this could be me and my brother. I just need to get kidnapped. Right. My brother would kill a guy for me. Yeah. That's, yes. that's who this movie's for. And uh, unfortunately, I'm not that person. I only have a sister. So uh, we do I'm, not have that relationship. Yeah. I'm an only child. So, um, yeah, if somebody had kidnapped like my cat or something. I would have been upset, but just that's... mildly upset. Yeah, <laughs> I'd go full Keanu if someone had attacked my cats. Well, Keanu, as in Keanu in John Wick, but also the movie Keanu, you know, with uh, with the cat with yeah. Key and Peele, Key and Peele, yeah. and they kill a cat. <laughs> um, so overall thoughts on this movie, I actually pretty much already said everything I had planned. Like the cinematographer had a pretty good eye for shots, but he doesn't have a lot to work with. There's a little bit too much shaky cam. There's too much held slow-mo shots, but, but he does a lot of good framing and picking out of nice photos. But this movie was so boring. Yeah, it was, it was... the plot is not well explained and it, 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 there isn't much of a plot to explain. Yeah, there's anyways. nothing to explain. It's just... Hey, your brother got kidnapped. I'm going to spend a half hour trying to figure out if he got kidnapped. Yeah, if it seems like we're rushing through this synopsis, it's really only because there's... An, I I was trying to take notes on this movie, and there's really nothing to say about it. The most interesting thing is that Nicolas Cage is playing Eddie again. Yeah, and... And it wasn't even worth it. It was not at all. Uh, honestly, uh, if... I would have been... Maybe less disappointed if that had not been hyped up, uh, but you know, hyped up, quote unquote. If um, we would have watched this before Deadfall, maybe it would have been more interesting. To be like, oh my god, it's that guy from Arsenal. I didn't know that he reprised the role. Uh, I'm gonna say no. Yeah, <laughs> probably not though. I, uh, yeah, that probably would have made me hate on Deadfall a little bit. But then Deadfall would have redeemed itself at least. Whereas this one, it was like hopes high. And dashed, whereas that would have been hopes low and 
exceeded. Yeah, exceeded. Just this movie is bad, and not even in a good way. Like Deadfall, yeah, kind I think of. Was, Deadfall or is a good comparison where it's like Deadfall was bad. Like I don't think anyone is arguing that it's a good movie. But right. like at least it was well, interesting I am, and. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it, was, it, it, it yeah. wasn't a good movie. Exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. It, it was very entertaining. entertaining. It was not a good movie. Um, but this movie was just boring. And it's, I felt like it was five hours long and it's only 90 minutes. Yeah. It it not was a, a single shark attack. It was a mess. It was no incoherent, sharks. incoherent, hard to follow, not interesting or captivating in any way. And sort of like this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. Why do you listen to this, you fucking idiots? Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, it's a uh, it's a nine out of ten for me. Not a ten out of ten. I can't can't give it a full ten out of ten. It's a nine. Okay. Is this the best movie we watched or the second best movie that we've watched? Um, I'm gonna have to go with second best. <laughs> okay, all right, <laughs> because I have no other options in there. Hey. But, so to sum up, bad movie. Do uh, not watch. Yeah. Do not, not watch. Like even, even if you're doing a podcast about Nicolas Cage, just pretend that this one didn't happen because the internet has kind of tried to pretend. I am excited to rewatch this one when it uh, inevitably advances to the next oh round. Oh God, I but, hope not. Um, <laughs> for now, I'm going to try not to think about it ever again until then. I don't think I will ever think about this again. Yeah. Hey, maybe well, it might haunt my dreams. Maybe but. years from now we'll be like, hey, remember that one time we watched that fucking movie? I don't think it's that memorable. I feel like in two weeks I will not remember what this movie was. Until you see somebody get shot in the nuts with a shotgun. <laughs> maybe maybe like, oh, oh, shit. There was a slow-mo shot of Buckshot flying right into a guy's testicles, and oh, that yeah. was kind of cool. Well, not uh, cool, but hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> I would say um, rad and uh, the best scene of any movie that we watched so far so oh god but yeah that's our thoughts on arsenal um a movie totally lacking an arsenal or a plot yeah two guns that's not an arsenal <laughs> and um i think we're gonna take a very short break and then we'll be back to you with knowing well purvis just left so you guys know wait purvis is out of the band no he just left the studio oh oh he called you and then showed up yeah, I wasn't answering the call because I wanted to be involved in the podcast, but then he showed his his dumbass showed up here. Overbearing much? We need to get one of those recording lights or like recording in progress lights. Yeah, seriously. What did he have to say? I'm not a fucking therapist, man. That's what he said to you. Yes, no, <laughs> no, he said that no, he he's he's mad because Kitz wants to leave the band. He doesn't want to break up a good rhythm section, so he wants to go where Kitz is going, but Kitz doesn't want to he, i i can't even i can't even say i don't want to i don't want to get involved in their drama, but they're sucking me in man what why is it that Kitz wants to leave? Do you know often Vincent hit him oh uh the drinking problems okay yeah, he hit him with a bottle. I don't oh. see what the big deal is personally but it's not my place. Yeah, to like that's rock and roll. I, I think that they need to stop being so. I understand if Arlo is going to be sensitive because he's a sensitive soul. He's a songwriter. He's a singer songwriter, and that's he he his come up was in coffee shops. I understand that. I mean, just if you want to be a successful band, gentle, like a, you just just a with a full, yeah. powerful man voice. If you want to be like a Disturbed or a Breaking Benjamin or a Three Days Grace or one of these great bands, yeah, um, you got to take a bottle to the head from time to time. Yeah. Some well, people call it inspiration. Usually it's from the audience. It's called being a rock star. Exactly. You gotta have that rock star attitude, which involves scars from uh, bottles to remind you of what you've been through to it's make not, the art you've made. To remind you that the past is real. <laughs> it's not substance abuse if there's no abuse. Or substance. And that's what Arsenal's missing. <laughs> substance. <laughs> We'll be right back. Uh, what? Arlo? Yeah, yeah, I know, man. Just we we we, we got to do this. Just just go home. I'll I'll see you tomorrow. 
He's still fucking there. Yeah. All right. All right. Peace, man. Uh, yeah. See ya. Don't let him come upstairs. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I just heard the door. Okay. All right. This yeah. has been a long day. Yeah. Um, um, it's for, for, for the listener, it's like one in the fucking morning now. We've been dealing with uh, national pleasure drama for a good four or five hours. And um, we tried to get him to just sit down and watch Arsenal together, but uh, they heard some of what we said and they weren't really down. So yeah, they weren't too thrilled about it. But um, but the good news is it seems like Vincent is probably committing to go to rehab, and I I trust him right now, which is the first time I've trusted him in a while. So yeah. hopefully this is the end of it. I mean, you know, there's only so much we can say for Purvis and the Black Eye and all that, but you know. Hey, shout out to Vincent for making the right choice. Yeah, it's good. It's good to hear him going to rehab finally and cleaning up because I um. You know, like, when he came over here and was throwing around just bottles and bottles, like, I don't know how much he'd been, I don't know how he's alive. I don't know how he carries all the bottles. Yeah, like, does he carry a backpack in his car full of empty bottles to throw? Yeah, I, he never has them on him, so I just, it's just all of a sudden a bottle manifests. You that's know? actually how it started. He used to just collect bottles to throw at people, um, but then he couldn't find bottles, so he would uh, buy alcohol and then chug the alcohol to have an empty bottle. Yeah, we, we all heard this with. story like four or five times, man. You don't have to tell it again. <laughs> you know, uh, just uh, just trying to keep everybody on the same page. Yeah. Just, I, I, am I the only one who's a little bit pissed at Frank right now? Uh, a little bit, just for enabling his brother so much like well, that. Not but... even just enabling him, but, you know, just fucking, oh, God. It's just like, he just cashes out. He doesn't do anything. It's just, it's all our problem. Yeah. I just can't believe they have all this drama. Yeah, I can't believe uh, a band would uh, get into beef within the, within the band. Yeah, I mean, you know, crazy. it's behind the music type stuff. You know, I mean, this have, it's rock and roll. I get it, but I mean, good God! Crazy. After after all these, I mean, it all seemed like sunny beginnings last week when we got that recorded, and now it's it's already taken a serious downturn. But hey. but we can't stay hung up on that all day. I mean, they've already wasted like five hours of our time, and we've we've got another movie to talk about here. Right, absolutely. I'm I'm sorry for being hung up on. I mean, I'm really sorry that this band is just you know that it's interrupting our flow and getting this done. You know, because this is coming out of you know you guys' budget ultimately. Yeah, that's okay. They um, they gave us a great theme song, and uh, I mean, at least we can help them clean up. But um, I just hope they stay together because I need that money. Yeah, we'll we'll get it from them. We'll get it from them. Don't worry. And uh, moving on now to Knowing, this is a movie also starring Nicolas Cage, as one can expect. Sorry, I'm kind of brain fried. I've been dealing with a guy going to fucking rehab, but it came out in 2009. It was directed by Alex Proyas. The production company is Escape Artists and um, DMG Entertainment. And uh, with a runtime of 121 minutes, this is one of the longer movies we've watched recently. A lot of them have been hanging around the 90-minute mark. Um, and yet, didn't seem as long as Arsenal. No, That's Arsenal true. felt like it went on for so much longer. See, what, uh, what, this, uh, what gave this movie a bit of an edge um, is that stuff happened in it. Which is crazy. You don't expect that to happen in a movie. Right. When it started, I was like, oh, I can't wait to watch uh, two hours of just random cuts to nothing happening. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now, this movie had a budget of $50 million and grossed $186.5 million at the box office. So this is the most successful movie we've covered on this podcast to this date. Um, in fact, it's one of the few that is in the positive. I think, <laughs> I think the only other one that was was... Uh, Next, or was that Bangkok Dangerous? No, it next. Was, it was next. Yeah. yeah. Bangkok Dangerous was seen by us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, still not great on the review side of things. The, not terrible. Yeah, not, not terrible. But 
Well, the reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, 33% on the tomato meter, 42% by the audience. The reviews on Metacritic, 41, uh, and user score of 6.1. So they're, uh, it's hovering around the 50-50 mark on a lot of these. Maybe a little on the lower side of it, but some, some fun facts about the movie. Uh, well, it's hard to find anything fun when you've just had to talk about alcoholism for five hours, but... Um, it was shot mostly in Australia because that's where director Alex Proyas lives. Um, Alex Proyas also directed, I think, iRobot and The Crow. Yeah, so. he's uh, the reason he's in Australia uh, is because he's in, in hiding from murdering Brandon Lee no, yeah. of The Crow. Here's another fun fact. The elementary school in the movie is William Dawes Elementary, which is named after a man who rode with Paul Revere to warn people of the impending British invasion. Just like Cage is running around trying to warn people of upcoming dangers in this yeah. movie. And so this movie is in the National Treasure verse um, because of that Paul Revere connection. Yeah, I believe, I, you know, if I don't see some callbacks to this in National Treasure that I wasn't getting the first time I saw that movie. Oh, yeah. We'll I'm probably pick up on them now. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get them this time. And um, uh, here we had some fun facts. Here's a dumb fact. Uh, uh -huh. We see Nicolas Cage's character fall asleep several times in this movie, never in his own bed, which is Holy shown shit. in the movie. <laughs> what a real scumbag. Yeah. Always just sleeping around with his own child and with <laughs> on the couch. And yeah, he uh, he sleeps with his, his child in this movie. Uh, yeah. Wait, are you fucking serious? <laughs> well, he sleeps next to him. We, it's not a Cage pedophile moment. Or is it? I don't know. They cut. It could have happened, and it was just chosen not to be shown. We don't know. Yeah, I think they, they took out all the scenes that Brian Singer did uh, direct for this one. <laughs> yeah. Brian Singer hung around on set a lot for this one. And, uh, he, he encouraged <laughs> some weird stuff to go on between Cage and the child actor, and uh, the, you know the production company just didn't want to have it. But um, going on to the plot here. It's 1959 in Lexington, Massachusetts, and we see a girl named Lucinda staring at the sun while on recess and hearing whispers. Uh, we learn that the school is making a time capsule that will be opened in 50 years. It was Lucinda's idea. They all submitted something for the anniversary of the school or something, and all the children are supposed to draw what they think the future will be like and put it in a capsule. Simple task. Simple task. Just draw a picture. But guess who can't do it? Guess who doesn't do it? The one whose idea it is. Oh, Lucinda. 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 Numbers aren't pictures. Lucinda just writes out a long string of numbers and doesn't stop until her teacher rips the paper away from her to put it in the capsule. Then we see the bearing of the time capsule and Lucinda goes missing afterwards and there's a bunch of people searching for her. Lucinda's teacher finds her in a storage closet, clawing numbers into a door until her fingers are bloody. Oh, yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Mm. And then, bam, smash cut, Nicolas Cage. His name is John Kessler in this movie, and he has a son, Caleb, who's like 10 to 12 years old. I couldn't really tell. Mm, was, uh, yeah, young he's... enough that Brian Singer's still interested in him, but, uh, <laughs> but old uh, enough yeah. that he's kind of slipping out of that range soon. Yeah. So. He old enough that, uh, or young enough that he's going to an elementary school. Who would have guessed that this is taking place 50 years later, which is coincidentally when they vowed to uh, release the time capsule. Yeah. So they dig that shit up. Oh, yeah, they dig that shit up. And, uh, well, <coughs> hold on here. There are a couple of things I want to say first. Um, Sorry, uh, I just, I didn't want to hear you talk. Uh, yeah, I, I know, it's kind of annoying. We, we see Cage is a professor of astrophysics at MIT, and in that shot, he's giving a very thematically relevant lecture where, for some reason, in an astrophysics lecture, he's talking about free will and determinism. Yes. Which uh, seems like it's more fit for a philosophy class than, than a physics class, but whatever. And then he talks a lot about the sun. It's, uh, it's very in-your-face foreshadowing. Yeah, <laughs> the, the sun and its distance from the Earth. Oh, yeah. And uh, here's a fun little physics geek note as... As someone who studied physics, he's standing in front of Maxwell's equations, or what are written on the board, which are used in the study of electromagnetism. Uh, I don't really know why, in an astrophysics lecture, you'd be talking about these basic equations and putting them up there. But uh, um, I think the fun, fun fact. 
So the relation is that it's so it's Maxwell's equation. Uh, Maxwell houses coffee. Coffee's hot, like solar flares. Ah, uh, so that's got to be the connection. Yeah, I can't think of anything else. And don't forget about R and B singer Maxwell, who additionally is hot. Oh yeah, oh, yeah not only physically but musically. Yeah, so and re- popularity wise, there's references all over the place in this one. Um, so keep your eyes open if you're watching it. Um, lots of Easter eggs. I think uh, if you look in the the background. Of the classroom, he has the Infinity Gauntlet um, in a case. So, yeah, then somebody uh, in the class, um, one of these real smart kids, is like, hey, Professor Kessler, what do you think about determinism versus free will? And he's like, yo, shit's random AF. Yeah, shit's all random. Shit's, he, he even says that. He's like, uh, fucking rando. It's so rando. Everything's so... Random. LOL, so random. Yeah. Should yeah. also point out, one of the students is actually Liam Hemsworth. Uh, yeah, oh, in his yeah. first uh, film role. Uh, is he the one who asked him that question? I think it's the girl that asked the question. He asked some other question or, like, answers a question. He has, like, yeah, one he line. answers a question from Cage that this is where it all began for the brother of Thor, who is not Loki. Um, yeah, and so when Cage is like, oh, yeah, I think everything is random, uh, the... Audience is obviously like, um, well, I can't wait for you to find out how wrong you are. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, we find out that Cage's son, Caleb, uh, goes to the same elementary school as from the intro, and today they're opening the time capsule. Caleb starts hearing whispers, and he gets loose in his note with all the numbers. Yeah, uh, and so Caleb uh, is also has like a hearing issue, mm-hmm. um, and so he has like a hearing aid in. He's not deaf. But he has a hearing aid in. Uh, and Cage makes it very clear he is not deaf later on. Like, hey, yeah, he goes on for a long time about that in that museum scene. He's not deaf, thank God, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so when he hears the whispers, like his, it sets off his, uh, his hearing aid. And he's like, ouchie, ouchie. Um, and the other thing I took note of is that, so they're opening this time capsule filled with envelopes with everybody's drawings. And... The kids are fucking reaching for these envelopes like uh, they're in a mosh pit. It's yeah. insane. They're all like, oh, my God. Like They're all so excited to yes. get these letters. Calm the fuck down. Yeah. It's like they're hang, handing out the new um, the new Jonas Brothers CD, right? That's, so yeah, it's like that's what all the topical. tweens are into yeah. nowadays. It's like they're handing yeah. out the new hot video game. Or, uh, or not to maybe. date this, but the Jonas Brothers did just release a new song a few months ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And oh, it, wait, are all the tweens into that still? Or is this no mostly idea. reminiscing older people who were tweens? My guess is the reminiscence. I heard Maxwell produced it, actually. Oh, yeah. Or who? Maxwell. Oh, yeah. Um, and the new uh, Jonas Brothers the song. This is not the R&B guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, the new Jonas Brothers song actually uh, completely accurately predicts the next 50 years of disasters. Um, that yeah, there's some care. backmasking in it. How we know that already? Don't ask. Yeah, and if you play it backwards, then you get the death toll and the latitude longitude uh, coordinates of where there will occur. Uh, but and some satanic shit. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> yeah, the pr- satanic stuff. It's uh, we'll save that for the Jonas Brothers uh, after show, which we do. <laughs> we'll um, save that for Left Behind. No, yeah. <laughs> and then, um, back to knowing. One of the uh, things I just want to point out here is like he, they all, they're all pulling out letters or whatever, and like reading them, look at the pictures. I, he pulls out the one with all the numbers. Some other kid comes by and is like, that's not a picture. Ha, sucker. And, like, runs off. Like, what was the point of that? Yeah, I, don't, I guess because kids really like pictures, right? <laughs> I bet you're <laughs> jealous that I got a drawing. <laughs> but then when uh, Caleb takes the note home, his dad's like, hey, you weren't supposed to take that. That's the schools. <laughs> like, so apparently uh, the the school owns this exclusive art yeah. uh they have all the very rights important to it. it's very important and it's very very naughty that caleb took his uh little sheet of numbers home mm-hmm. and um cage is just after his son caleb goes to bed cage is just slamming liquor we see him pour <laughs> a, a shot just take it and immediately pour another yeah he's and like if i have to hear that fucking kid talk again <laughs> <laughs> um he just sits down on the couch and uh, spills a bunch of liquor. Like, he fills his glass so high to the top with, like, whiskey or something that it's spilling over the sides. And he uh, 
He goes and he sets it down on the note, which leaves a little circle on the center of the note, which is a thing I wanted to talk about. There are tons of shots with just a circular object in the center of it. It's a little visual motif, like when it opened on the sun, the logo, the time capsule hole. But anyways. Um, no elephants, though, unfortunately. Unfortunately, no elephants. But he notices that um, in the middle of the circle are the numbers uh, 9... Uh, nine one one zero one two nine nine six, which he then puts some slashes in, and he realizes it's nine eleven oh one two thousand nine hundred ninety six. And that's crazy. That's that a bunch just, of random numbers would have that in the middle. Oh yeah, some kind of numerology shit. But uh, he realizes that well, that's the date of the nine eleven terrorist attacks, and then how many people died in them. Well, and, he doesn't know that uh, because the the first thing he does is. Uh, when you see the numbers 911, right? The first thing you do is uh, you Google 911. Well, the first um, thing you do is never forget. <laughs> You're supposed to never forget, but he's clearly forgotten because he had to Google it. It's like 911. That sounds like something. Is that like 911? I'm supposed to call it. Is that my kid's birthday? Mm, no. Maybe it's my dead wife's birthday. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And she's uh, 2,996 <laughs> years old. Uh, <laughs> But uh, after that, he goes down a rabbit hole looking through the note and realizes it's filled with the dates of tragedies and the number of deaths that occurred in those tragedies. And uh, all the most large disasters that have happened throughout for the last 50 years, like Hurricane Katrina is on there, some like random fire that killed like 80 people or something is on there. I'll tell you one uh, disaster it didn't predict, though. That's Arsenal 2017. <laughs> But yeah. that's only because the sheet ends at 2009. It's true. That's true. It couldn't have gone that far ahead. But um, he also realizes that one is dated tomorrow, and it says that 81 people are going to die. So oh, he's uh, a little freaked out. He presents this to a colleague at work, and the colleague's like, you're making too much of this. And he goes, stop it. Stop. <laughs> stop looking at numbers. Stop and it. Bad cage. Bad physicist. <laughs> Bad. Uh, and... The the one thing that his colleague forgets to say is, uh, hey, what's the deal with all these numbers that are completely irrelevant? You have a you have a bunch circled, but a bunch that aren't circled, and uh, you look stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like there's some circled ones, there's a bunch of non-circled ones. Like, what the you, fuck you, are you doing? You, you picked all the you picked a random bunch of numbers and you gave them meaning, and then there's a bunch half the shit doesn't mean anything. Hmm. Um, and Cagey's like, well, I'll show you, and storms out of there. And um, you'll see in 30 to 40 minutes that you're <laughs> wrong. <laughs> and uh, Caleb is playing outside when two tall, pale, white haired dudes pull up in a car and just hand him a black stone and then pull away. Yeah. And their faces are completely obscured because, uh, you know, you pull up on a nice, bright day and you're sometimes your face is just a shadow. That's yeah. just how it be. Cage runs out like, I don't have to talk to strangers. It's like, like I'm talking to strangers. Quiet Quiet playing soccer. Do your homework. <laughs> Go circle some numbers. <laughs> uh, and yeah, they, they hand him some mysterious black stone. Um, and uh, we have to figure out uh, how he's going to turn that into drugs or something. Um, yeah, he's going to flip it to get $10,000 worth of cocaine and then sell that. But he's going to get right. kidnapped by himself. Yeah. Um, well, Cage's sister swings by, and we find out he has a pretty strained relationship with most of his family, especially his father, who's a pastor. Um, and uh, then uh, we see him driving to pick up Caleb from school, and Cage realizes that the other numbers that weren't circled in his list of things are GPS coordinates, which precede the dates and death tolls. And then he realizes that the one that's supposed to happen today that kills 81 people has the GPS coordinates that he is at currently. Oh, shit. And uh, he's stuck in traffic on the freeway, gets out and says, like, what's going on here? Why is it shut down? And then, <coughs> bam, a passenger jet is, flies right across the freeway, takes out a car, crashes and explodes. And then he runs over there. Um running around there's a guy who's running around on fire going ah and cage is like hey hey trying to talk to him and the guy's like ah and he's, he's like, like hey I think he's like stop or something like that was he telling him like stop being on fire yeah, please stop he like being on steps fire. into the fire and <laughs> contemplates like trying to pull this guy out but he's like what am i gonna do if i get him out he's he's on fire um and so the guy just collapses in front of him and he's like 
on to the next one, I guess. <laughs> Let's find someone who's not on fire. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, he did, too. I do want to point out that this shot, from the plane crashing until the end of it, it is one single two-and-a-half-minute-long take that is actually a really nice piece of filmmaking, yeah. I think. This whole plane crash scene was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, the, the the tracking shot was nice. Um, apparently, this was filmed on a, in Australia uh, on a highway that was, like, under construction. Yeah. So they just uh, blew the fuck out of a plane. And apparently, uh, every time they had to reset this scene uh, to, you know, do another take, it took four hours. Holy shit. Um, so that's excruciating. Yeah, four hours to just. Uh, I mean, I'm not. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, say that they didn't uh, work real hard. But four hours. Um, Get your some guys together. on fire. That guy and, was on uh, fire for the entire four hours, yeah. and uh, he did, in fact, die. Also, <laughs> I mean, I used my GPS on my phone and everything to get where I'm going. Are, do people have GPSs in their car that give you? Like latitude and longitude coordinates? Maybe in 2009. Yeah, maybe uh, the super old school ones, but I, I have would, never had that. Why would that ever be useful to you? Yeah, uh, not in a car. I feel like if you're camping, maybe, or something. Yeah, if you're like that. geocaching. But, um, but, uh, like for like taking your kid to school? Like, why did he have this thing? I guess like, like maybe he's a physicist and he's like, I'm into that kind of thing. But I like, like it. Oh, we have then. to pick up your uh, friend from uh, their house? Uh, what's what are their coordinates? <laughs> I need their exact latitude and longitude. Oh no, I have the address. No, uh, <laughs> that doesn't give me, help me. Give me the coordinates. So yeah, we we learn from a new shot that's showing it that eighty one people died in it. So it all lines up with the prediction exactly. And uh, Cage goes home and his sister's watching his son. And he's just like, I'm I'm going to bed. Like fuck all this. Like Caleb, you're going to bed too. Don't watch the news. News is bad for you. It's fake news. <laughs> Don't watch the news and don't read any numbers. I didn't fully understand why he didn't want his son to watch the news at all, like for the rest of the movie. Yeah, I don't well, really know. Uh, <laughs> if I could uh, give a personal anecdote, um, when 9 11 happened, my uh, parents immediately turned off the TV um, and said, Don't look at this. Uh, reality is scary. And so, uh, I was kind of raised in this dreamland where everything was uh, real peachy. Um, and uh, So you definitely forgot about 9-11. Yeah. Until Nicolas Cage Googled it for me in this movie, <laughs> I had no fucking idea. You broke the first rule of 9-11. Never forget, man. My gym teacher said it was the Chinese. Really? <laughs> yeah, he went running through the hallway saying, It's the goddamn Chinese! <laughs> and... He was right, uh, actually. Uh, yeah. Hey, isn't that crazy? <laughs> Sorry, I've been drinking from this bottle that Vincent left here, so I'm kind of feeling it. Um. So anyways, uh, Caleb wakes up to one of those guys who handed him a stone from the car earlier, uh, standing in his room, who points to a window, which is a big circle, all them circle shots. Um, and Caleb looks out the window and sees just the entire world is on fire, like deer running around on fire, screaming. And then, oh, and he also before he sees everything on fire, and I, he sees one of the mysterious people from the the car in his room. Yeah, yeah. I said that. Oh, you said that. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> and so, one thing that you forgot to mention um, is that uh, Nicholas Cage is in this movie. Um, but and, do you uh, guys remember that scene where the kids are like in his bed and one of those weird mysterious guys shows up and like points to a window and it's like, hey, another circle shot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like um, and then not many will remember this, but then he sees like a bunch of shit on fire yeah. outside. the oh, yeah. Window. Including but, uh, like a deer. Yeah. I'm going to kill um, myself. Um, <laughs> moving on. Um, Caleb wakes up and one of the albino men is standing in his room. <laughs> And he points out the window. <laughs> it's the guy from the Da Vinci Code, and he's uh, whipping himself in the back. Uh, uh, but basically, the kid wakes up screaming, Nicolas Cage runs in. Yeah, uh, he sees the albino guy outside and goes like, You, stay away from my son! Yeah, and he's like, Hey, kid, you're fucking stupid. There's no fire out there, you fucking idiot. Dumbass, I'm gonna go drink more. <laughs> then, uh... Me too. <laughs> Then uh, Cage uh, seeks out Lucinda's daughter. 
Diana. Or Lucin is the one who wrote the note in case you forgot. Yeah. Uh, I can't keep track of names. Her daughter's name but... is uh, Diana, or as we affectionately call her, Dirty Diana. <laughs> so uh, he finds out where she lives. In, instead of just knocking on her door and talking to her, he decides to stalk her. <laughs> stalk her and follow her until she sees he sees her going to the museum with her daughter. Uh, where he just tells his son to go talk to her daughter, and then he just slinks on up to her and starts talking to her. Yeah, he's stalking a woman with his son, like, showing him how to stalk. <laughs> he's like, hey, go distract the daughter, and I'll and explain gives me a later. to go talk to the mother. <laughs> exactly. And then we'll go get a juice box together. But they, like, end up hitting it off, and they're like, oh, you're a single parent, too. Like, me, too. Crazy. This is where Cage very adamantly states that his son is not deaf. Yes. Um, yeah, he's like, hey, and before you fucking say some shit, the kid's <laughs> not deaf. He just knows sign language. Okay? <laughs> it's not like, weird. It's normal. And, uh, yeah, so they sit there, and it seems like it's a first date or something, kind of. like a. And then he's just halfway through. He's like, look, I'm not going to lie here. I followed you here. <laughs> this is an accident. I need to talk to you about your mom and how she predicted weird shit. And he starts, like, spouting at her all the things that she's predicted and how, and tells her a couple of dates that are coming up. Like, he says, in New York City tomorrow, 174 people are going to die. Yep. And then he says something about October, October 19th. 19th. And uh, she's just like, uh, fuck off. I'm you crazy fuck nut job. <laughs> and then she runs out and leaves. So then Cage is like... I'm going to New York City. I'm going to stop this thing. And uh, he doesn't. Uh, he, ex he actually um, he opens up his bag and he finds a bomb in it. And he's like, oh, <laughs> was I not I, supposed to bring this? I, it's me. I'm doing the attack. <laughs> so, yeah, he sees a guy on the street. Um, yeah, that he thinks has a bomb, but actually is just a shoplifter full of DVDs. Yeah. He chases him down to the subway. Very but... predictable. Uh, also, <laughs> when he the whole time he was chasing him through the subway, I was like, this guy's like clutching his stomach like he's like he's probably got a, a sack of potatoes in there or something. <laughs> Not yeah, a bomb. Like like, I would run, too, if Nicolas Cage just started chasing me. <laughs> yeah. It's a little unnerving. You don't know. He could go full deadfall and high fucking yeah you. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the reason the guy starts running away from him is because Nicolas Cage just stares him down, which led me to believe that this was going to be the love interest. <laughs> um, Based off of Bangkok Dangerous and Next, it's, yeah. it's heavily implied that it would be a love interest. But um, he chases the guy through the subway yeah. um, and turns out big whoops. The real disaster is that the train gets derailed and splatters fucking everybody. Another really cool scene. Yeah, I yeah. will. I will say the uh, the CGI in this movie it's not perfect, uh, yeah, it's, but it's not bad. It's uh, not bad. It, I think like the train derails and like goes into the crowd and everything. Yeah, people are getting splattered. It was, it cool. was really cool. I think it if was. we were watching this in two thousand nine when this came out, that would have been like top notch CGI. And yeah, we've just gotten a little oh, better definitely. since then. I would have thought that they actually set a bunch of deer on fire. But they might have. I don't know. And uh, so he goes home and uh, Diane is there waiting for him with his daughter. And she's like, yeah, I believe you now, I guess. And uh, that day, October 19th, is my mom always told me that was the day I was going to die. Again, Diane. normal. Yeah, very normal. Uh, I don't know how many times my mom has told me, Nick, you're going to die on November 10th. 2094, oh, which is a very long that. life. I hate when my parents are 100 do that. years old. It's Lucky like, you. Hey, can you, can you just call to say hi? But no, it's always like, hey, Zach, you're going to die. <laughs> and here's Seven when. <laughs> <laughs> then my mom crawls out of the TV. Ugh. Your mom still got that long black hair over her face? Never changes. <laughs> She's got a videotape she gives around to people, too. Uh, she tried to give me that tape once, and I was like, I, I don't have a VCR. It just I lied. I didn't leave me alone. Yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah so, I die, I'm going to die when my mom says, not your mom. <laughs> <laughs> Cage and Diane go to Lucinda's old mobile home to look for clues, and they find a bunch of the same black stones that the, the albino dudes keep giving to Caleb. And So uh, apparently they were just... Handed them out to her throughout her life. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and the, the whisper people love kids. Uh, it rocks. Yeah, it makes me think that... Uh, Maybe Brian what, Singer's one, one, of, one of these guys wanted to be Brian Singer. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but 
But uh, they determined that the last, uh, the last thing it has E E written on it backwards for some reason. I don't know why, but it me. Uh, they determined from clues in the um, in Lucinda's mobile home that it means everyone else, and that's going to be the apocalypse. Yeah. So and one one of the other things that they spot, uh, there's an engraving of uh, Ezekiel's chariot vision. Oh yeah. Um, which uh, in the Bible or whatever, it's like some chariot made of like a, it's like guided by heavenly beings or some dumb shit. It'll come into play later. You'll see. Oh yeah. If uh, if you want to see exactly what it is, it is uh, Math House Marion's engraving of Ezekiel's chariot vision from 1670. So go Check ahead and Google that. that. If you haven't, it was a big hit in 1670. Let's bring it back. <laughs> While this is going on, Caleb and Abby are surrounded by the albino dudes in their car, and Caleb just lays on the horn to alert them. So Cage runs out, chases one into the forest, and the guy just opens his mouth and shines a blinding light from his mouth, and then Cage loses him, and the guy just disappears. But they wake up the next day, and uh, it's one day away from everyone else dying, one day from the apocalypse, and... Uh, Cage has a realization from Diane's daughter, Abby, uh, coloring in on that Matt House dude's, the, on the Ezekiel chariot race thing, the sun, and he's like, oh, shit, what about a super solar flare, which, he you know, as... Yeah, he uses his big science brain to figure out... He uses out, his uh, big astrophysics man brain to yeah. uh, get in contact with Neil deGrasse Tyson, who tells him... Yeah, super solar flares and stuff. And yeah, then, super solar flare would actually skid out on the sand. Uh, so. <laughs> and uh, this shit sounds like the My Sacrifice video by Creed. <laughs> but I don't know that I know that video, but I know that I don't want to oh, watch we're it. Watching that shit after <laughs> this, I swear to God, we are. All right, Nicholas Cage should have been in that video. Uh, so I bet he is. He might be. He might be in Creed. <laughs> Yeah, I think Scott Stapp. Have you ever seen Scott Stapp and Nicolas Cage in the same room? I haven't. I have not actually. Um, but I got. I just got one thing to say while we're on the subject. Uh, more like Scott Stop. <laughs> Thanks. Oh! Thank you. Thank more you. like Scott Staff infection. Oh. Stuck oh, in his own prison. A little <laughs> lame. There will be a laugh track That's after a that. Bit, Everyone. A little bit too true to life. Let's not bring any more reality into this. So, um, um, yeah. You guys want the theme song? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're good. Give us one second, and uh, I will, but, we'll uh, blast that. When once Cage has this realization, he runs to his lab at MIT and like tells his colleague, and the colleague's like, "Oh shit, we're fucked." And then he's like, "Yep." And then he calls his dad and is like, "Hey, we haven't talked in a long time. I know we've had our differences, but I love you, and you need to find food and shelter." And then his dad just gives him the old Ivan Drago, and is like. If I die, I die. And yeah, he's like, uh, if God says it's my time, uh, I, who am I to fucking argue with the big man? The big JC that isn't John Cusack. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like, hey, in case you forgot I'm a priest, let me get religious on you for a second. Um, so uh, Cage breaks into the elementary school, and, well, he found out from Lucinda's teacher that Lucinda had carved something into the door there and uh, becomes convinced that she had been cut off before she finished. So she had to get it out somewhere and she was carving the GPS coordinates of the last date into that door. So he breaks into the elementary school, steals the door for some reason. I don't know why he doesn't just do whatever he needs to do with the door while he's there. You he need the door. He steals the door steals and takes it back to his house, then starts... Uh, scraping the paint off it to try and find the numbers that are uh, scratched in there. At this point, Diana's just like, but you're crazy. I'm taking the kids and running. Yep. (laughs) And then he's like, hold on, hold on. And doesn't pay attention as she does that. (laughs) Um, It literally took him like two minutes. She could have waited two minutes. Yeah. If, if everybody else is going to die, I'm pretty sure the exact location of the next disaster is planet earth. Uh, It's, It's a good bet. So maybe this was a waste of time. <laughs> just maybe. Or maybe How do you know give... everyone just doesn't go to the same spot on that uh, day? Yeah, maybe everybody That's... on Earth convenes in one area. It was the Avengers premiere. Oh, uh, yep. Yeah, you know what? Makes Avengers sense. Endgame comes out on October 19th, <laughs> 2009. 
Holy shit. So, um... Yeah, uh, that takes the kids. They oh, yeah. Cage, stop to get gas. I yeah, guess. Cage yeah. runs out. And he's like, oh, they're gone. Gets in the car, runs off after them. But Diana stops at a gas station, and um, the kids get taken by the mysterious rock man. men. Yeah. Diana uh, steals another car. Yeah, and chases after, after him. After gets hit by a truck and fucking, fucking dies. Yeah, t bone by a semi, oh, insta yeah. dead. And, she gets um, super dead. Well, Cage follows. He stops at the gas station. He's like, where did that woman go? And she's like, oh, he, kids got stolen. She stole a car. Took off <laughs> yeah, just, despite the fact that this guy is in a gas station that's being looted by dozens of people, he saw exactly everything that happened with this one set of people. Yeah. Um, so good on him. Yeah, good for him. But, um, Real hero. So Cage pulls up on the scene of the accident and finds Abby in the, or not Abby, I'm sorry. Diana. Diana. In the backs of an ambulance, dead. The paramedics are trying to revive her. She's not dying. They call it at midnight exactly. So she was supposed to die on the day everyone else died. She did at precisely the rollover of the time, because this is the day at the end of the world also. And uh, he sits there, and we get a small kind of touching scene of him mourning her, but I do want to say... I feel like it was necessary to have some sort of closure about Diana's character because she was major and they had she had some nice scenes with Cage, but it kind of grinds the action and the pace of this movie to just a dead stop. Like, yeah, because it's yeah. like when he's chasing after like his stolen kid, the yeah. world's about to end. Mm-hmm. No, now I gotta Let's mourn. <laughs> yeah, now now it's like three minutes of just nothing while Cage just sits there and kind of cries over her and like. I get it. Like, I feel like something's needed there to acknowledge her, but it's, um, it, it kind of breaks the tension. But then afterwards, Cage pulls up on the GPS coordinates that he uncovered, which were the coordinates of Lucinda's mobile home that they'd been at before. And he finds Caleb and Abby there, Abby being Diana's daughter. And they're each holding two albino bunnies. Uh, fun fact, bunnies, common symbol of fertility. Oh, oh yeah, and uh, why was that be now in theaters? <laughs> Caleb and Abby, it's a boy and a girl. They fuck sometimes. Abby and they Eve. make new people. <laughs> oh shit! Uh, Nicholas Cage is chasing it after them and follows like the car tracks to this giant. The black stones are everywhere, and that's where Abby and Caleb are holding these bunnies. There's also a doe and a deer, a female deer. Ray, a drop of golden sun. Holy <laughs> shit. We are uncovering so much. It's almost like there's two of each species coming to this. <laughs> it's thing. almost yeah. like, and they're in a riverbed, which is generally fills with water kind of quickly. And, yeah, it's uh, crazy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the uh, Caleb goes up to Cage and says that they were chosen so that everything could start over again. And uh, they walk up and the albino men tell Caleb telepathically that Cage can't go with him. And we actually get a kind of moving scene again where Cage, you know, hugs his son and says, like, goodbye, you have to go with them. Like, I, I can't come with you. This is for you. Like, we'll meet again someday. Um, and, uh, and then we get the real payoff of uh, his kid knowing sign language. Because uh, yeah. uh, as, uh, yeah, the, he's on this spaceship thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, which represents Ezekiel's chariot or whatever. Oh, yeah. Um, and as it's uh, pulling away, he's signing to his dad. Yeah. And uh, he's probably say, like, saying, like, you and me together forever. Oh, yeah. Like, I think it was, uh, fuck you, dad. I think we kind of <laughs> glossed over this. Those mystery men turn out to be angel aliens. Yeah. yeah. They kind of like evaporate into, they look like Bubble Buddy from SpongeBob <laughs> SquarePants. <laughs> Angelian. Um, Okay, Frank has no shit called me 35 times since this section of the podcast has started. I gotta take this, so, yeah, you're still rolling, just letting you know. All right. Man. Fucking Jesus Christ with these fucking Cadillac brothers. Real well, divas well, in the rock industry. So, after, after a ship takes off, Caleb and Abby get on board, and a ship takes off, and we zoom out and see it's flying off of Earth, along with maybe, like, you know, like 50 or 60 other ships. They're all, like, launching... And uh, Cage falls to the ground crying. Uh, And then he goes to his parents' house in New York City. The streets are in utter chaos. Everyone is panicking and running. Uh, He 
walks up to his family and hugs them all in a final embrace. And um, they are engulfed by yeah. fire. Yeah. Well, his dad says to him, this is not the end, son. And then Cage is like, I know. And then world ends. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, and they cut out the scene where he's like, this is not the end, son. Um, we're going to go to heaven um, where <laughs> God is um, because God is doing you know, and, and God wants us to die. Well, see, I kind of thought that last line was significant because it sounds religious coming from the pastor, but I think it was also a little bit like Cage is like, I know it's not the end because Caleb is still alive and they're going to carry on the human race wherever the fuck they just went. So yeah. I was kind of like, I don't know. This Caleb's going to get, yeah. get fucked by that little girl. Um, <laughs> and uh, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. Then the closing scenes are Caleb and Abby dressed in white being dropped off in a field of sweeping grain. Like, whoops. A field of windswept grain with a giant tree in the center. Space grain. Maybe. Space grain. <laughs> and uh, space tree of life. Yeah. Space um, tree of knowledge. It's almost like Adam and Eve. Mm-hmm. Holy shit. That took me like hours of research into this movie to figure out that was the symbolism. Oh, oh yeah. It was really hard to pick up on all this. So, so <laughs> subtle. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so we see them on this planet and all the other spaceships, or well, um, we don't know where it is, uh, yeah. but all the other spaceships are Drop landing in the distance. The, yeah. And um, We see them and all the other kids running towards the tree in the center. We see some far off in the distance, too, like two little figures running towards it. But Yeah, so we, we have hope for the future um, on Mars. The, uh, Elon <laughs> Musk was actually one of the angels, um, <laughs> and so that's where they are now. Um, I so. thought it was kind of odd that's just like, okay, we're going to drop off a bunch of kids on this planet. Good luck. <laughs> like, yeah, they're like, they're kidnapping children and everybody on Earth is like, okay, it's our time to die. You can do whatever the fuck you want with our kids. I just feel like, oh, we're, we saved these kids brought them to another planet where there's just nothing. <laughs> like, good luck. Yeah, there's... You're on your own, suckers. How about instead of a big tree, like a fucking... Chuck E. Cheese or at Dave and Buster's or something. Yeah, they go to these spaceships just over to Dave and Buster's. <laughs> they just give them a handful of tokens. <laughs> yeah. So this movie, not not to sound like I'm fucking writing a book report here or something, but this movie has... I mean, we are writing book reports, but that's <laughs> irrelevant. Yeah, this movie has some pretty obvious themes that it's going for. A big one, which Cage directly stated to the audience, free will determinism type thing. We yeah. kind of... Um, falls on determinism. Another one that I kind of picked up on, which early on in the movie, Caleb was kind of <clears throat> seemed like fighting with his dad, like trying to get more control. He's like, I'm older now. I can make decisions for myself. And Cage is like, yeah, yeah, but do your fucking homework and go to bed. And then at the end, Cage has to kind of let go and let his son go. It felt like it, it was kind of a theme about like parenting and letting your letting go of your child as they grow up in life and being yeah. able to make their own and decisions. And then after... Cage's kid gets taken by the aliens. Uh, then Nicholas Cage goes to do his homework. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But uh, overall thoughts about the movie, everyone. Frank never left the house. He was in the basement huffing nitrous. That son of a bitch. Hey, uh, I swear to fucking God, he was down there huffing fucking nitrous. Not my nitrous, right? There's, there's other nitrous down there. Yeah, there's the big fucking, the giant cylinder of it down there. All right, I just don't want this to affect me, personally. Oh, fucking, is he gone now? Yeah, I turned off the supply, and uh, yeah, he finally left. I think, I mean, shit, I locked the door, so hopefully he doesn't get back in. Oh, hold on, Dave, somebody's clawing at the window. (laughs) You gotta be fucking joking me. Oh, no, different guy, different guy. Oh, yeah, it's just a junkie who wants (laughs) to come. He wants to steal our coke. It's, yeah, just a junkie. Um, I'm starting to regret ever picking up that project. I'm starting to regret <laughs> ever getting that guy hooked on heroin. <laughs> um, but anyways, overall thoughts about the movie. I think the visual effects in this movie were really well done. There were some cool shots. There was good editing and transitional edits. So like as a piece of filmmaking, this is actually good. There, there are a lot of shots where they'll like have an object in frame and then cut to a similar shaped object in the same part of the frame. Really nice, beautiful edits, stuff like that. Uh, Visual effects are done. There's like that long tracking shot um, of the plane that I think is another nice piece of filmmaking. That's all well done and and good. Um, Yeah, and uh, Cage's acting in this is uh, 
pretty good. Like he's not uh, so blatantly Nicolas Cage in this movie yeah. where it's like distracting. Hmm. Um, like he's actually just being acting. an actor. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, like the, the, the focal point of this movie is not him like screaming to the heavens or doing something weird. Um, he just, uh, he just kind of uh, throws his acting chops on and uh, he really, uh, I mean, it's, it's not over the top at all. It's not over the top. He's not going to win an Oscar for it, but it's uh, it's not high fucking yeah. It it was good. There was no high fucking yeah, which is always a disappointment. That yeah. is true. There there needs to be at least one high fucking yeah moment. Yeah, but I I'm I'm I encourage him uh expanding uh and trying to you know really hit a high note in his career, which of course is 2000, 2009's knowing. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was all right. I I came watching this after Arsenal, so it felt amazing. Oh, yeah. Uh, Other way around for me. And uh, yeah, that it is just a made Arsenal that much worse. But hey, if you're ever going to watch a movie and Arsenal, watch Arsenal first. <laughs> if you're ever going to watch Arsenal, don't. But if you're if you really have to watch it before you watch Anything else? <laughs> Literally anything. Uh, but no, it, it was all right. It was, it was a good five out of ten. Like, yeah, didn't hate it, didn't love it. it Solid middle of the road movie. But. Yeah, and while there was like a lot of religious themes, it wasn't like uh, a religious movie. It wasn't like bash you it, over the head. It felt like more they were using religious symbolism and not trying to give you a religious message they right. were trying to convey their message through the same symbols of religion kind of like, like like neo in in the matrix I yeah was, or like signs where but way less subtle yeah yeah it it, it was it well, there were a lot not of, exactly subtle but still it was less subtle than that even but <laughs> yeah um one other thing i wanted to say uh besides that scene i talked about with diane's death this movie was paced really well and it keeps building tension and it kept me interested along the way for all the films we have watched. This was a good film. Yeah. I wasn't like constantly checking uh, how much time was left. Yeah. Like, uh, I would set, sit down and watch this movie fully. Yeah. Uh, this is one that like, if it shows up on Netflix or something one night, go ahead and watch it. Yeah. Yeah. Roll up a big fatty to watch. <laughs> I don't know if I would rewatch it necessarily, but, um, well, Probably not. Yeah. I don't know if I, yeah, I, I probably wouldn't rewatch it, but I don't regret watching it, you know? Yeah. Solid. solid Unlike watch. Arsenal, <laughs> which made me want to kill myself. Yeah. The, the plot was kind of predictable. You could kind of see the whole Noah's Ark thing coming from about halfway through the movie, but you're still kind of eager to see how it happens. I was invested in the characters. Solid, decent movie. Uh, I'm going to give it a six out of 10. Uh, I'm going to go six out of 10 too, but you know what? You know what I just realized? Noah's Ark had two of each creature, too. What? And so did the spaceships in this movie. That's Damn. crazy. That, that's got to be a coincidence. That's, that's fucking nuts. That, you know what? That really works out for them because there was some religious undertones in this one. Oh, yeah. 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 So, yeah, six out of ten. <laughs> um, I, I think it's pretty clear which one won in this situation. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, high fucking yacht to Arsenal. We'll see it in round oh, two. God, no, uh, anything but. Uh, here's the vote. Uh, yeah, just for the sake of uh, tradition, uh, can we get a countdown, uh, Engineer Dave? No. Uh, okay, well that's then. That's part of the tradition too. <laughs> let's all say uh, after I finish this sentence, what movie we are picking to win the <laughs> match up between knowing. And Arsenal in Cage Fight Podcast. Cage Fight! <laughs> Next up is Left Behind and Zandali. Uh, so another religious movie and then whatever Zandali is. Can't wait. You going to introduce the band? Oh, yeah. Uh, so while we're uh, while we're getting started here, uh, 
we got uh, in front of me here is uh, Nick. Um, and Hello. then uh, our returning guest, Zach Zebo. Thanks for having me back. Uh, and uh, I'm Mike. And we're here to talk about Arsenal and knowing. Uh, and we have talked about Arsenal and knowing. Uh, so I guess all. mission accomplished. Thank you. See you next time. Bye bye. Oh yeah! <laughs> this has been a solid work production. Solid work. Solid work. Uh, solid work. Hey, solid work. <laughs>